Welcome to the 10th episode of Rivanna Review, a program of stories, features, and book reviews. My name is Robert Boucheron. I will be your host for a half hour of reading aloud with illustrations and author photographs. The print magazine, Rivanna Review, is published four times a year in Charlottesville, Virginia, on the Rivanna River. I am the editor. The magazine is available in bookstores on the Main Street Mall in Charlottesville and other bookstores in Virginia. You can order a copy or a subscription from the website, rivannareview.com. Features are illustrated travel or literary articles. Book reviews are of titles you may not have heard about from small presses and by authors who are not bestsellers. To read the books mentioned here, please visit your local bookstore, online bookseller, or the public library. Contributors to the magazine live all over the world, and they write about places far and wide. In this program, we will visit Boston, Massachusetts, Northern Virginia, Santa Rosa, New Mexico, Victoria, British Columbia, Mobile, Alabama, and outer space. The magazine ends with the news from Habsburg, a picturesque town in the Shenandoah Valley. Today, the bell ringer of St. Giles Episcopal Church comes to the end of his rope. Story, Jazz in the Rain by Martha Patterson. Ron parked at the corner near Nancy's apartment building in Boston. Cold rain fell and he didn't have an umbrella. It was after five, he had come from work and he was dressed for the office. He hesitated, then got out of the Edsel. In the minute it took to walk to the door, rain dripped inside his coat collar. It soaked his shoes. From the shelter of the vestibule, he could ring the buzzer, but again he hesitated. The saxophone of Wayne Shorter's Armageddon came through Nancy's second floor window. She'd always loved good jazz, and Ron admired her taste in composers and band leaders. The music evoked a pleasant memory of nights with her. It was November, the late 1960s. Kevin White was the mayor of Boston. White opposed segregation and the vehemence about busing kids to school. Ron had voted for him. Racism in Boston was constantly in the newspapers, on TV, and Ron's car radio. The contentiousness between blacks and whites disgusted him. He had moved from Los Angeles to attend college, then stayed to start his first job, an entry-level job in insurance sales. Maybe that was a mistake, but it was how he met Nancy. She was a real estate secretary about his age, the early 20s. She was getting coffee at a cafe on her break, the same cafe he often escaped to from the office. Nancy looked approachable in her plaid miniskirt and short-sleeved sweater. Ron went up to her and chatted for a minute, then asked for her number, which she gave to him. They dated, and Nancy had invited him up to her place and given him a nice time in bed, though they didn't go all the way. That was more than a month ago. Today at work, Ron's boss gave him a dressing down his sales figures were poor, the lowest in the office. He should cultivate the clients more, be affable and chummy, learn to make small talk. Sports and weather, never local politics. He had a ready excuse, being from California. And most of the clients were referrals, a gift. How would he generate new business? Nancy had also commented on Ron's lack of manners and impolite behavior. He should hold a door for a lady, offer his arm on the street, assist her up steps. He took advantage of her good nature. In fact, they had an argument on their last date. Ron wanted to tell her he was sorry for offending her by calling her an office girl instead of what she was, a skilled typist and young woman. He picked on her clothes. He had even told her to style her hair like the cover girl on a copy of Vogue that was lying around her apartment. Nancy was disgusted and broke things off. If all you want is for me to change, then you don't want me at all. Story, Errands by Josh Mahler. Shaped like a square with a shiny lacquered surface, the bar was flanked by paintings of men in pastoral landscapes, fishing scenes in quiet country settings. Caleb took a seat on an open stool. He placed his phone face down next to his keys. With a hard stare, the bartender with dark hair and long sideburns peppered with gray sidled over. What's up? he asked. 
hands crossed in front of his body like he was holding his belt buckle. A Stella, a water, and a menu, Caleb said. The bartender nodded, produced a white rag from behind his back, and wiped down the area in front of where Caleb sat. He pulled a menu from under the wooden counter, laid it in front of him, and turned away. As Caleb studied the options, already certain of his order, he noticed to his left a man sitting alone. The man wore a blue shirt that had been washed too many times. It had a surfboard decal on the left side of his chest, and it bunched around the man's waist, as if the man had yet to reach a frame suitable enough to wear it. The man's hands were wrapped around a glass of beer, which was almost empty. He stared straight ahead, as if trying to figure out a deeper question requiring a level of concentration only a bar could afford. What an ugly man, Caleb thought, an old sunburnt smoker's face. He gripped the glass, fingers intertwined, and the skin of his fingertips pinked from pressure. There was nothing familiar about this man, yet Caleb had seen him a thousand times before. The blue shirt with the surfboard decal might be a significant detail. It might lead to a story about where the man was from, but time was limited after deviating from the list of errands. The man was someone he would never see again and think nothing of later. Caleb was pondering this when the stranger looked his way, noticed the attention, sat up straight, and spoke. Hello, how you doing? The man wanted to talk, Caleb could tell. He had the look of someone who hadn't used his voice in a while, someone who had stories to share and needed an audience to make them matter, to make them true. All Caleb wanted to do was drink a few beers, eat his food, and be on his way. But the man intrigued him. On the simplest level, he sat alone drinking beer with a passive air, unaware of people around him. Did he live in town or a neighborhood a few miles away? Maybe he sold insurance or real estate or surfboards. Maybe he wandered in from the sidewalk looking for a place to drink and be alone with his thoughts. Caleb scrutinized the man out the corner of his eye. The face was thin and deeply lined. His hair, while long and deeply combed, was the style of what his parents wore in photos from when they were just married. He sported no ring on his left hand. Was anybody waiting for the man to come home? Did anybody miss him? Probably not, Caleb guessed. He was a refugee from things not working out, and he wanted to talk about it, searching for all the reasons why. Feature, Santa Rosa, New Mexico, by Edward Boucheron. In October 2022, I was in Santa Rosa, New Mexico for four days. Santa Rosa, population 2,800, is the seat of Guadalupe County and lies on the Picos River. Historic Route 66 passes through town, as do U.S. Routes 54 and 84. An airport and Santa Rosa Lake are nearby. The glory days lasted from the 1930s to the 1950s. When Interstate 40 was built in 1957, traffic sped through town instead of stopping and business dropped off. My free time was limited, but I checked out the major attraction in town, the Blue Hole. It's a sinkhole, also called a doline or cenote, that is fed by underground caverns, part of the Picos River aquifer. Karst is the geological name for this eroded limestone terrain with underground water features. The Blue Hole is about 60 feet in diameter and 81 feet deep a scuba diving mecca for the Southwest, although why is a bit of a mystery. I suppose if you want to dive in any depth of water within a few hours of Albuquerque, it is your only option. It is the town swimming hole, and the surrounding masonry walls and steps have a municipal air, now somewhat aged. The clear, deep water reflects the blue sky overhead, hence the name. I took shots from various angles, but it is hard to get a comprehensive view. One item of interest is the path above the hole that has an abandoned shack, probably an admissions portal in times past. The path is overgrown with desert scrub, but it has the same masonry construction that surrounds the hole. The Blue Hole has been used since the town was founded in the mid-1800s, no doubt. It developed as a town park in the early 1900s. The town built a convention center next to the Blue Hole, the building also houses the Santa Rosa Visitor Center, 
a dive center, and to the Department of Motor Vehicles. I passed by an abandoned gas station and took photos. A new sign was posted in the lot next to it advertising 10 acres for commercial development. Why would a buyer want to develop a property on a section of Route 66 where half the current structures are abandoned? Johnny's Comet 2 restaurant is a true Route 66 landmark, the kind of place you would not stop to eat at on a bet, but a hot spot for locals who know. At night, it is covered with neon lights and looks more inviting than in broad daylight. A couple of months back, I got to meet and speak with Johnny Martinez, the owner. In 10 minutes of conversation, I got a large chunk of his life story and his photo. He is a Hikaria Apache who grew up in Santa Rosa and spent summers on the reservation with his mother. The restaurant name de derives from his father's habit of calling Johnny to come at, come at. Johnny contracted the expression to Comet. The original restaurant burned down in 1974, and this is the replacement, Comet 2. One wall inside is covered with certificates and photographs, including images of improbably large rattlesnakes being displayed by their captors. Johnny still works in the kitchen, which may be one of the reasons he is a vigorous 89 years old. Feature, Victoria, City of Gardens by Sonia Nicholson. City of Sunshine, a common theme in the marketing for this provincial capital on the southern tip of Vancouver Island. The Garden City of the West, named for Queen Victoria, began as a trading post and port in 1843, located midway between Seattle and Vancouver on the same body of water known as the Salish Sea, Strait of Georgia, and Puget Sound. Today, the city population is 92,000, while the Greater Victoria area, area has 397,000 people. I drive past the famed Empress Hotel. A few years ago, the new owners removed the iconic ivy that had grown up along its walls for as long as anyone could remember. It was reportedly damaging the masonry. Even in winter, the manicured grounds are a draw. I follow Government Street to the British Columbia Parliament Building, where visitors meander on the green lawns. It's a busy spot. Ditto for the causeway across the street. In summer, flowers planted between the upper and lower levels by the Harbor Authority spell out, Welcome to Victoria, a tradition since 1954. Though it's off season, activity surrounds me, and as always, color. I continue along the scenic route on Belleville Street passing the Pendre Inn, a Queen Anne-era building dating from 1895. Originally a private home and now a tea house with attached hotel, its gardens have seen a return to topiaries, once a signature feature. Afternoon tea beside a bay window or in warmer weather on the porch provides a front row seat. In the stately house's heyday, Mr. William Pendre used the grounds to show off his gardening prowess. According to the British colonist in 1913, the strange and grotesque shapes into which he had trimmed the trees were an object of interest to every passerby. Many of Victoria's grand homes boasted showpiece gardens. Some, like that at the Pendre Inn or Point Ellis House on the other side of the harbor near the Bay Street Bridge, are undergoing restoration and are open to the public. Across town, in the prestigious Uplands neighborhood, an Oak Bay subdivision designed in 1907 by the American landscape architect John Charles Olmsted, direct access isn't an option. But a drive or walk still provides a peek through wrought iron fencing or over stone walls at the grounds of some of the most expensive real estate in the region. The roots of Victoria's reputation as a city of gardens, however, go back earlier than any of these. For thousands of years, indigenous peoples here in Lekwungen territory thrived on the area's rich natural resources. They used native plants for everything from food and trade to medicine and ceremonial purposes. Today, a number of institutions and groups are working with First Nations to bring back and protect these historically and culturally important plants. Within Playfair Park's nine or so acres in the municipality of Saanich, adjacent to the city of Victoria, 
a restoration site offers a dazzling spring display. Under endangered Gary Oaks, those gnarled trees that define the local landscape, a meadow of commas, shooting stars, and other native plants creates a sea of purple. While the park is popular for its rhododendrons and azaleas, it's the wild Gary Oak meadow that shines. Standing on the pathway, one can imagine how the region must have looked prior to the arrival of Europeans. Book Review by Edward Lyonberry. It Falls Gently All Around, Stories by Ramona Reeves. In this touching and humorous collection, Ramona Reeves unveils the lives and desires of a cast of characters in Mobile, Alabama. These linked stories presented out of chronological order never solidify into the fixed narrative of a novel. They are dynamic, as though there is more to these lives than we will ever know. In the first story, Last Call, we meet Babby, who is working as a technician in a hospital. It's a busy night for the emergency room, and Babby is called from her desk job to interact directly with patients, a task she resents. Two gunshot victims are brought in, one grievously wounded. Babby hides in the ladies' restroom, her feet pulled up out of view. Her ex-husband, Rowan, comes to retrieve her, and the anonymous functioning of the hospital gives way to deeper connections and histories that intertwine these characters. The strange alliances and friendships between the characters are driven by compassion, though never full understanding. Donnie, who once was a truck driver and is now an aspiring yoga teacher, is dragged from his sober life by his co-worker Marty. Risking his probation, she drives him in a stolen car to her home where her boyfriend is in the process of moving out. Donnie recognizes that he has been manipulated into a support role for Marty. As the conflict between Marty and her ex-boyfriend intensifies, Donnie hides from the fight, finding refuge in a closet until he is compelled to stand up for her out of shame, chasing her ex-boyfriend out of the house. Once in the moment, though, he realizes that he has a deeper connection to his co-worker than he suspected, that somewhere along the way they had become friends. Mobile is an almost mythical representation of a southern city with its truck stops, dive bars, and country clubs, where chefs routinely overcooked the grilled chicken, rendering it the consistency of the rubber tip on a turkey baster. Yet in this setting, predictable at times, Reeves surprises with her language and with the ways her characters love and hurt each other, as in the scene where Donnie's sister-in-law cuts his hair, an intimacy that bristles with infidelity. Her fingers began trolling his hair. Somewhere beneath the litter of tangles and split ends was a delta waking at the touch of her hands. She combed and smoothed. The spot between his shoulder blades stirred and grew warm despite the wet hair gathered there. 
Book Review, The Truth and Other Stories by Stanislav Lem. Stanislav Lem was a 20th century Polish writer, mainly of science fiction. From 1946 to 1987, he published stories in magazines and at least 24 books of stories and novels. The books were translated into more than 50 languages. In 1976, the American science fiction writer and critic Theodore Sturgeon wrote that Lem was the most widely read science fiction writer in the world. The New Yorker magazine published some of Lem's stories, and the MIT Press reissued some of his books in paperback. They feature two recurring characters who are sometimes narrators, Perks the Pilot and Ijon Tichi, Space Traveler. Perks is a young astronaut who muddles through, while Ijon Tichi reports from the Futurological Congress and outer space. There are plenty of strange planets, odd beings, advanced robots, and teasing conundrums. In 2022, MIT published a collection of stories that originally appeared from the 1950s to 1993, but not in English. Translated by Antonio Lloyd-Jones, the book is The Truth and Other Stories. Fans will rejoice, but the book functions equally well as an introduction to Lem. In his introduction, Kim Stanley Robinson writes, his characteristic voice, both calm and intense, magisterial but monomaniacal, even crazed, becomes ultimately what one might call passionately rational, which is just the right tone for science fiction. Rooted in technology and a point in time, science fiction often goes out of date, but Lem has staying power. His stories deal with characters and social norms as much as they riff on aspects of robots, artificial intelligence, chemical reactions, electrical communication, and space travel, the staples of science fiction. As in the stories of Ed Edgar Allan Poe, the narrator may be nervous, obsessed, guilty of some crime, and burning to tell, or he coolly analyzes incredible events and offers an explanation. Far from being all talk, the stories are full of action. In The Hunt, the first of the 12 stories, we follow a fugitive in the wild, a male character who runs for miles, covers his tracks, throws false clues, and hides in a cave. Gradually, we realize he is a robot, tougher and stronger than a human, and very clever. The hunt happens in the future, when wild animals are extinct, and this is what blood sport has become. The prey can be killed, and for all his wiles, he can be deceived, as he is, by a girl who pretends to help. The chase lasts for 22 pages, exciting to the end. News from Habsburg, the bell ringer. James Pettigrew was the bell ringer of St. Giles Episcopal Church for as long as anyone could remember. Longer, in fact. The oldest members of the congregation remembered him from early childhood. Clinging to their parents' hands, they had trooped through the narthex on Sunday morning and glanced to the side. In the shadows, James was hard to make out in his black suit and dark brown skin. They were afraid of him and curious. Safe in a pew, they whispered, is a bell ringer like anyone or is he a special kind of person? James was five feet tall and thin as a stick. To ring the bell, he pulled down the rope with all his might. Then he flew directly up, hoisted his own height in the air on the bell's return swing. He looks like a monkey, the parents said, though they never saw a monkey do any such thing. Generations repeated this phrase thoughtlessly. James' old style manners and grave demeanor deflected ridicule. Nevertheless, the title of Sexton was too dignified for a black man. The children grew up, married, and had children of their own. James stayed the same. On weekdays, dressed in work clothes, he tended the churchyard. He cut the grass, pulled weeds, raked leaves, gathered twigs brought down by a storm, and trimmed the privet hedge. As people passed, he touched his hat, a decayed fedora, and greeted them in a guttural voice. He never forgot a name, and he needed to be told only once the name of a new arrival. He swept the church, cleaned pews, took out trash, and made minor repairs. That bell ringer is worth his weight in gold, people said. 
James was punctual and reliable. He never went on strike or took a vacation. He missed a Sunday only once in his career, and then by no fault of his own. In the course of repairing the bell tower, workmen inserted wood blocks to immobilize the bell. Then they forgot to remove them. Or the workmen were Baptists who wanted to play a prank on account of their feud with the Episcopalians, and they left the blocks on purpose. This incident happened, if it happened at all, before anyone in the congregation was born. The bell of St. Giles was part of daily life in Habsburg. It was hard to imagine how a day could start without it, like eggs without bacon or coffee without sugar. Yet for all its regularity, there was no doubt the bell was rung by hand. There's something about the way he does it, people said. You can tell from the sound, whether it's for a wedding, a funeral, a plain service, or the time of day. One January morning at 8 o'clock, the bell tolled three strokes and stopped. At breakfast in the rectory, musing over the newspaper, Father Percy raised his head. What could have happened? He hurried to the narthex. James lay on the stone floor, collapsed in a heap. He clutched the frayed end of the bell rope. The rector took James in his arms. Shocked at how light the burden was, he carried him into the church office. He called for an ambulance. This roused James to a paroxysm. Going to the hospital meant only one thing.